Thank you all so much. God bless you. You all are so good for my spirit. I thank you all for your love and for your uh, wonderful reception. It is always a blessing to be here, being around my good buddy Wayne and the staff and all of you. I just love you guys. You feel like uh, my home church, even though I'm not here very often. I, I feel home when I'm here. So thank you all so much for uh, allowing me to take the opportunity to fill in tonight. Um, we're going to talk about a topic tonight that, to be honest with you, is, uh, give me just a second, let me find out what I'm doing wrong here. Um, I don't know what happened to all my slides, how they got out of order here. So uh, all I know is Jeff Little touched my computer last. <laughs> And I thought I heard a little snigger from him a minute ago. But, you know, Jeff, you can't, you don't know what to. Is that what you did? I'll lay hands on you. Yeah. Uh, give me just a second to get the, this back in order. I think this is where you belong. You stay right there. All right. Um, like it or not, <clears throat> technology is going, and it has, and is going to continue to change our lives. Uh, most of us like it, but maybe after tonight, uh, there will be some things that maybe will not uh, sound quite as good. I just hate to meet people who uh, will make statements like, I'm not going to get a computer, I don't need a computer, and all that. And that's fine and good, obviously. Uh, mankind survived thousands of years without electricity, as far as that's concerned. But um, if you ever felt like you're being left in the, in the dirt, you're going to uh, in the next 10 years. Because the, the things that are going on so quickly, even those who are in love with technology, it's going pretty crazy. And um, before we mock all this stuff, I think we need to take a look at some of the threats and how God felt about it a little over 4,400 4, years ago when at the Tower of Babel, the Lord had mentioned that even at that point, even at that point at which man had gotten with the Tower of Babel, he said, look what they've been able to accomplish with just one voice, one language. And then he says something that, and, and God is not given to extremes, folks. He says, nothing can be withheld from them which they have imagined to do. Do you think God was using uh, extremes in that? Or do you think God was really serious about that? Well, to be honest with you, he took the first step in making sure that that would be delayed for a long time. And God is so smart and so um, thorough that one thing changed man's dilemma and delayed his self-destruction, basically, is what we're, we'll see. And that is he confounded their languages. Now, here we are. Thousands of years later, uh, when the leaders of the world meet at the UN, they have their little speaker systems, and they've got the exact same problem that it was existent in, at Babel, and that is the confusion of language in their interpreters. Man is doing everything he can to get back to this place where they can take over. And when I look at s passages like this one, I know that it is referring to our time because Daniel had closed out the book with a, a commission from the angel. And he says, Daniel, I want you to shut up these words and I want you to seal the book to the time of the end. I remember doing a series on this. I don't know if many of you remember it, but I, I went into what that meant because he says 
time of the end. And then you've got this colon afterwards, which explains what was being said. He says, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And I'll go over this real quickly. But when you consider the fact when it says they were going to run to and fro, I want you to think about this. An average American automobile, uh, when you put them out, the population of our United States, we in, in a given year will encircle the globe 70 million times. Now, you want to talk about traveling to and fro. That is a prime example of that. And when you consider the fact that knowledge would increase, how astonishing is it when you think in, in, of all mankind history, 90% of all scientists who have ever existed um, are alive today. And when you consider the fact that every minute, scientists, these scientists are adding 2,000 pages of scientific knowledge and that if one person would try to read what is being produced each day it would take you five years to read it this is how fast this thing is and according to norman edmund the founder of edmund scientific company with the computers and the internet and the accessibility of information Knowledge is doubling about every 73 days in, in just a little under 10 years. At this point, about every 18 months. And we have seen this explosion of knowledge in so many different ways. One way that has just been an astonishing breakthrough is the technology called nanotechnology. And it is where they are able to manipulate matter on a, 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 an atomic level. On, on the, on, here, for example, are machines that are the size of cells, red blood cells. These, if nanotechnology is going to be able what they're promising, it is possible that they could put these into your bloodstream and find the cancer cells before anyone else would ever be able to find them and to eradicate them with this technology. This is something that we would all dream for and hope for, and it's something that we need to consider. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is, is transhumanism, and I first was exposed to this after watching a documentary on uh, the gentleman I'm getting ready to quote from. Kurzweil is uh, uh, a, a very, very famous inventor. He, here's what he says though. He said, a computer in your cell phone today is a million times cheaper and a thousand times more powerful and a hundred thousand times smaller than the computers at MIT in 1965. Um, just to throw in a thought here, MIT is where those boys were from the bombing in Boston. Um, so it, it doesn't always produce good stuff, right? But he goes on to say, so what used to fit in a building now fits in your pocket. And what fits in your pocket today will fit in a blood cell 25 years from now. Now, obviously... That may sound far-fetched and, and cr quite extreme, but we know for a fact, folks, that that is exactly the direction it has been going now for, for decades. And there's no issue about whether or not it's possible. In this uh, documentary, he introduced a word to me called singularity. And this is the thought, you gotta really catch this one, and then we'll understand where this is going in just a little bit. Transhumanists use the term singularity as a term that means at some point in the future, you're going to have the expression of, um, of knowledge get so far advanced that it's going to pass up mankind's ability to keep up with it. 
And at that point, it's going to change society. And that is what is called the singularity point. And they're predicting that it will probably take somewhere uh, of about somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 35 years for that to take place. In the meanwhile, for this to be a reality, you've got to understand there's a big job for you and I to do, and that is to do our best to bring the gospel to the world. Because all this knowledge does not make somebody good. Matter of fact, to be totally honest with you, all this knowledge could intensify the evil that man is capable of doing. I don't think there's anybody here that doubts the destructive nature of, of what science has brought to us already. I mean, would, there would be no atomic bombs, H bombs, if there was not um, far advanced knowledge. But when you consider the fact what General Bradley said back in 1948, and I want you to please listen to this, and it's, I know it's starting a little slow here, but just give me a minute, it'll, it'll, it's gonna get good, so just stick with me. But he said something really powerful. This is not, this is not a born again man to my knowledge, but he says something, I think, I, I hear this coming from uh, a military leader, and to think, wow, we can't even hardly get Christians to talk like this. But he says, we have grasped the mystery of the Adam and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. Ours is a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants. We know more about war than we know about peace, more about killing than we know about living. With the, monstro uh, with, with the monstrous weapons man already has, humanity is in danger of being trapped in this world of moral ad uh, 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 adolescence. Our knowledge of science, listen to this, has already outstripped our capacity to control it. We have too many men of science, too few men of God. Now with that being said, I want to give you real quickly a couple things to think about. Now let me just tell you, this is not a typical Wednesday night message. And if you are a typical Wednesday night attender, uh, a typical Wednesday night church attender, you probably don't even think about some of this stuff that we're going to talk about tonight. But I want you to try to make effort. Honestly, I truly believe from my heart that you need to hear this and you need to hear perspective of godly worldview perspective on this because you are going to have to face this stuff. And it is whether or not we're, we're ready for it or not. Uh, the other day I went to a a local grocery store, and I was amazed to see multicolored cauliflower in front of me. I'm talking all c colors. I'm, I'm, cauliflower was always white to me, you know, but now purple and green and red and all these different colors. And it is, it's just a little fun trick of the world of genetic engineering to modify things on uh, a level that science has been able to, to learn. And this DNA makeup of all living things, man has started to play with this, which when man starts playing with God's things, that's not going to always be good. And matter of fact, Los Angeles time recently in their science, um, section had an article, uh, S the, the caption reads, study points to health problems with genetically modified foods. And I think we've all been hearing about these and the dangers. And of course, here we are in Indiana and you think about um, the corn industry and raising crop and understand uh, the connection of uh, Monsanto and what they're doing with corn, for example, and, and building because they're saying, hey, we want to build into the ability to reject, um, you know, um, insects or whatever it might be, or to be able to, to grow bigger or to produce more each harvest time and whatever. But see, folks, you got to understand, there's a reason why God put that stuff in there. And when man starts messing with it, he thinks he's 
It's like the little teenager think he's smarter than his daddy. You know what I'm saying? And in our mind, we think this is right. Well, we, we see this illustrated in movies so many times. I remember um, um, a movie that uh, came out, I think it was probably 2009, 2007. And it was a, 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 a story that was supposedly to happen last year when a military uh, uh, man had, uh, had been studying uh, along with many others to try to help an issue that had developed in a quick time because some uh, genetic engineering of uh, the measles virus had produced what they thought was the answer to cancer. Uh, what ends up happening is it killed humans. It, it, it destroyed the cancer problem, but as the process, it ended up killing 90% of, of, of people on the earth. And the remaining 588 million survivors became predatory, vampire, zombie-like creatures that fed off of what was left on the planet. And uh, of course, I want you to, to watch this interesting little section. This is how the movie opens. This is, uh, um, what, I mean, not the words right here, but in a moment you're gonna hear an interview of a, a newscaster interviewing this doctor, and then it takes you into the first seconds of the film. And it's very the world of medicine interesting. has seen its share of miracle cures, from the polio vaccine to heart transplants, but all past achievements may pale in comparison to the work of Dr. Alice Crippen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Let's talk. So, Dr. Crippen, give it to me in a nutshell. Well, the premise is quite simple. Um, take something designed by nature and reprogram it to make it work for the body rather than against it. You're talking about a virus? Indeed, yes, in this case, the measles um, virus, which has been engineered at a genetic level to be helpful rather than harmful. Um, and I I find the best way to describe it is if you can if you can imagine your body as a highway and you picture the virus as a very fast car um, being driven by a very bad man imagine the damage that that car could cause then if you replace that man with a cop the picture changes and that's essentially what we've done how many people have you treated so far well we've had 10,009 um, clinical trials in humans so far. and how many are cancer free 10,009 so you have actually cured cancer? Yes, yes. Yes, we have. So here it is three years later. <clears throat> and this is uh, New York City. And, um, you know, obviously it's a... Uh, it's an entertaining movie, um, science fiction, post-apocalypse type movie, and um, but it, it it at least makes you to think and to put in, into our mind what we are now literally capable of doing as human beings, and. I don't think, folks, in any stretch of imagination that any of this takes God by surprise. Where this all fits into the last days is quite amazing. Now, when you consider human cloning, the ability to take a, you and make another one just like you, you get into all kinds of scenarios. What do, does the clone being have a spirit? I mean, is this, is this a, a real creature or what, what is, what's there? Um, uh, matter of fact, the number one movie that is in the theaters right now is about uh, a clone. It is, uh, it's a futuristic mu movie from what I understand uh, about 60 years into the future. Uh, the earth has experienced, uh, 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 you know, a, a, a destruction and as a result, uh, uh, Tom Cruise, who you find out is a clone, is 
sent to harvest water from off the planet. And there's, there's a ton of stuff that goes, but see, this is the kind of stuff that people watch. So it's on people's minds. And this is reason why obviously we should always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies in us. But now the question now obviously has to be, what about human cloning? And where would this fit? Even when we read statements in the book of Revelation about the image of the beast, what is that? I mean, you don't hardly ever hear anyone talk about it, but when you're talking about uh, uh, the beast, the antichrist who receives a deadly wound, but sometime after this, the false prophet is able to make an image of the beast and for it to be alive and for it to speak and to communicate. And really, if you read this, the text in Revelation 13, 18, you will find out it is he who introduces the, the whole system of what we commonly call the mark of the beast. Now, the question has to be, what happens when fallen man gets into the ability to structure and restructure and manipulate DNA? I'll give you a perfect example. This just made news the first part of this month. Uh, U.S. government, I'm, I'm sorry, U.K. government given the go-ahead for three parent genetically altered embryos. Now, that doesn't sound like a whole lot right now, but basically what the ideal is, is that this, their, their particular authority system in Britain called the, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority has approved, the, uh, the government has approved for these scientists to modify a person's DNA, taking three different individuals instead of two, like God made it, and to create, obviously, another human being, not thinking that the genetic changes are going to carry throughout subs uh, subsequent generations to come. And what this will do, by the way, the EFE, I'm sorry, the HFEA is known to be among the most permissive national regulatory bodies in the world, having been the first to approve of human, listen now, human slash animal hybrid cloning experiences. Sex selection and the creation of designer saver, savior siblings, embryos that are used as tissue sources for gene therapy for existing children and once they get the therapies out of it and then they destroy them, okay? Now, this opens up a whole realm of stuff. Matter of fact, several physicians wrote The Guardian, which is the leading magazine in Great Britain, and said, quote, it would be the first time such international genetic modifications of children and their descendants were expressly permitted and would open the door for further genetic alterations of human beings with unforeseeable consequences. These are not ne even necessarily any believers at all saying this is just science saying, wait a minute, guys, we got to we got to stop. And, and the thing that is thrilling to this, the culture is the fact that now technically two homosexuals, two lesbians can in fact produce an offspring because now they got the permission to take three parents. So you got a, one female and two males. You take from the two genetic makes up, makeups of those males put together with that female and you produce um, a child. And folks, the, 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 it's, it's getting pretty crazy, to be honest with you, because now it is more of a selective breeding, which is, uh, they can, they're claiming there's just, it, it's un, unbelievable the amount of possibilities that this could open up. Now, I think this was interesting. It was less than, actually next month, it will be three years ago that this made national news, it's the scientists in the U.S. have succeeded in developing the first living cell to be controlled entirely by synthetic DNA. So now, technically, 
they can actually create the DNA. It is completely man-made in the sense, and you'll understand what I mean in just a moment. And so basically what they've been able to do is take this, uh, this bacterium genetic software and transplant it, transplant it into a host cell. And as a result, it looks and it behaves just like DNA. And as time has gone on, they're saying that this is a landmark, but at the same time, it produces some serious things because you have to think of the ethics of all this. What is this going to open up? And when you consider what we're doing, when we start playing God, folks, it always has a bad connotation to it. Amen? I mean, literally... We're saying now that we have acquired the capability now to be a creator. Man has advanced so far in his technology, now he can make his own DNA. Which technically, if you really, really want to get down to it, we're not really doing that. Because we're, all we're doing is modifying and manipulating things that already exist in the biological material world. Okay, so technically we've, we're not creators. We are still down to the basis of we're manipulators of something that God made. And we're not so hot after all. And yet, you know, the, as the old saying is, you know, you, uh, you know, God and the devil had a conversation. Okay, I'm going to create. Oh, go ahead and start. And Satan reaches down and picks up some dirt and starts to form and say, so, oh, oh, wait a minute. You create your own dirt. Right. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> So to make anything from nothing, well, then that would make you a creator. And that ain't happening. All right. Now, let me just tell you why I thought this was interesting. That happened. And then the, literally the next month after that announcement was made, there, Hollywood had been working on this movie for about a year. They released a movie called Splice. And this movie... The plot basically was about two scientists who uh, were starting to understand that their grants were going to stop and they were going to go ahead and push everything in high gear to try to create a new organism as a result of their DNA studies. <clears throat> and so they created this bee who they ended up naming uh, Drin. And Drin is... Uh, uh, a very, uh, when you first see her, uh, she's very deformed, but she turns into a very beautiful woman super, super fast because of just the way that uh, the storyline wanted to make it out to be. And as it ends up, turn, turns very deadly. <clears throat> when this all was being, was, was coming out, the storyline opens up an example of what I'm talking about. Why I thought it was interesting, though, is that in this movie, she has the ability to have wings. And when you start looking at this, <clears throat> and keep in mind that passage we read earlier in Genesis where it says, the Lord said, the people is one. They all have one language. This they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And the fact of the matter is, folks, when you look at the, the, the film, the way the movie was, was, was made, this woman, this being, becomes something very similar to Revelation chapter 9 when it speaks of the demonic stuff that ends up showing up right in the middle of the tribulation. For example, you get in chapter 9 when you... Uh, you hear this unleashing of out of the bottomless pit what is referred to as locusts and it refers to the shape of them were like horses prepared into battles and they had faces as the faces of men and then it talks about them having wings and, um, and then it talks about them having stingers in their tails which is exactly what this movie de displays some of this stuff in this in 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 Drin. Well, what's interesting is that 
what you see in this, it, it's, it's, it basically is a science fiction slash horror film because what ends up happening is this superhuman hybrid starts destroying massively mankind until they can get rid of it. And then they come to find out it has in, inbred it into some other human being. Now, let me just tell you this. Now, this is where it's going to get a little weird for some of you because it's probably the first time you've heard this. But hybrids in the Bible are always associated with the demonic and with devil worship. And there are s several examples of it, and I'm not going to be able to go into this at, in any detail at all. But I, I want to at least make you think about some of this stuff. You read a very weird account in Genesis 6, right before God des decides to wipe out the earth. The earth has done, mankind has done something so, so bad that he has to destroy the earth. In the midst of all this, it says that Noah was pure in his generation. And if you look that up, it is literally refer referring to he was pure stock. He was not affected by this weird thing that was happening to try to destroy God's plan of the promised Messiah seed by, by infusing into it. When it talks about the sons of God came into the daughters of men and as a result produced Nephilim, the, 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 the Hebrew word for, for giants. It's a weird study. If you really want to get wacky, go find it on the internet. You can get really wacky on some of that stuff. I just warn you, you know all you need to know in the word of God and you know, don't take this stuff too, too far. But I will tell you that that phrase, sons of God, ben Elohim, is, is the exact same phrase that's used when the sons of God presented themselves in the first opening chapters in, in Job. These are angelic beings. No, nowhere in the Old Testament is this referring to Christians. Uh, this is referring to beings as a direct created act of God. Matter of fact, all sons of God are directed acts of creation of God. If you are a son of God, you, didn't, you weren't born that way. You had to be born again to become that way, right? But anyway, it says that these, notice what it says, that there were giants in the, in the earth in those days, and watch this, and also after that. And if you remember David and Goliath and some of the other stories, you'll know that there was giants after this, the flood. But watch this. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bear children unto them. That's the weird part. We know from Peter and Jude that they left their original habitation, their original status of, of embodiment and lowered themselves. And because of their sin, they are reserved in Tartarus, a, a division of hell that is confined for just for them. It's a special judgment because of what they attempted to do. And they sinned in a very grievous sin in God's eyes. And it says, then they bear children unto them. And watch what it says about these children. They became mighty men, men of old, men of renown. This is where so many of these myths and these lures and these fables of half gods, half men came into existence. Now, if you will take a study, and, and, and again, this is not a thorough or even attempting to be, I'll just give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. In Leviticus, and we're still in, uh, in the writings of Moses here. He wrote, obviously, Genesis. In Leviticus, it says, and they, they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a whoring. Now, what's interesting about that particular Hebrew word is that is where we get the word satar. Now that particular, if you look that up in the Hebrew, you'll find what it says, a shaggy, he goat, devil, goat, hairy, kid, rough. <clears throat> satar. Uh, in mythology, it shows up. In Greek mythology, it shows up as pan. Um, it shows up in a lot of things. Matter of fact, it even shocked me that C.S. Lewis even had in the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. It is a very demonic creature. And... Um, and that they actually sacrificed it. And then notice it says they went a whoring. This particular demon god is associated with some very twisted sexual acts. And if you've ever seen 
uh, you know, some of the association in Greek mythology about that, they were such as that. And then again, we read in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 21, where it doesn't even, it doesn't even attempt to translate it as devils. It just flat out says satire. It's the exact same Hebrew word. Now, the thing that you need to understand about this is this hybrid human, half human, half goat is not uh, considered in scripture something to be far-fetched. Matter of fact, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 32, another example of, uh, of hybrid. In this case, half bull, half man, or says, and they sacrificed unto devils, not to God, and the word devils there is uh, shade, um, and it is demon, he, in, in the Hebrew, demon or, or devil, and not to gods. Now watch this, to gods whom they knew not to, what kind of gods? New gods to whom your fathers feared not. In other words, in the uh, Shadash is the word there. These are completely new. This is something that came into existence. And, and, and if you look at, uh, they're, they're known throughout Babylon, Assyria. These uh, take on an appearance that very much are likened unto the, the um, cherubim around the throne. And Lucifer was a cherubim with multiple wings, had faces like men or faces like uh, lions or faces like bulls, a uh, calf, faces like eagles. And this is where a lot of this comes from. <clears throat> now, I don't, I'm not even going to tell you where this, where this all leads to. But I will tell you this, folks, that the, the, the largest monument standing in the entire world is a, an example of a hybrid. It is a half human, half lion there in, in Gaza, in, in Egypt. And of course, I was there, saw it. I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. And they don't even know all the story behind it. It's, it's very confusing. All they know is that it means the terrifying ones. And of course, what they have is, you know, examples of other times when the Egyptians had these type structures and they've come to find out this is kind of what they thought it, its original look must have appeared. And then we read a very odd passage over in 2 Samuel, when Samuel, uh, or, or when David, uh, mighty men are fighting, and uh, th these men are encountering, in this particular story, uh, Benai, who comes up against the Moabites. <clears throat> and if you remember, the Moabites, Moab was the offspring of incest with Lot and his daughter. And as a result of this came what was called two lion-like men. Now, I think that's very interesting because the very latter part of the verse refers to lions. So it's, it's, there is a distinction, a definite distinction being made there. These people know what lions are and they know what men are. How do you describe this lion-like men? Now, I know it's, it, it's weird there, but folks, this is weird. To look at a mouse and see a human ear on the back of a mouse. But that's what happens when men start messing with genetics and DNA. This is, uh, in the breakthrough of science, this is uh, considered uh, phenomenal. Because now they're able to genetically reproduce parts for humans. And understand, this is no more uh, a, a myth. It's, it's no longer a legend. It's, it's no longer some kind of science fiction. This is a reality. The, the problem is when you start emerging animal and humans, you start producing a lot of ethical issues. And not only that, you are talking about some pretty science fiction type horrors. For example, we read in the scripture where um, Balaam's donkey is able to see as, as, he's, as he's carrying Balaam to go to Balak, he sees an angel. Balaam doesn't see it. And some people believe that animals have an insight, a, a, another sense. 
Uh, for example, we've seen proof of this now that animals, sometimes not just insects, but I'm talking elephants and giraffes, can detect when an earthquake is about to happen. They will, they will flee the region. And this is sometimes hours before it happens. They've been able to prove that dogs are now able and certain type of animals can smell tumors on people or people that have cancers. Um, and you think about bats with the use of radar and, uh, and the light spectrum that animals see that we don't or the, uh, the hearing ability to be able to hear. What would happen if you put a super soldier together like that? And this is exactly why the military, and I'll talk about them in just a moment, are leading in the, the support, spending billions of our tax dollars to help study this out, to incorporate this in the military. The question obviously happens, if man is able to cross into that realm, what happens if man is, gets able to see into that supernatural realm? Where is that going to put humans? And what, is, what door is that going to open up? Now, let's get into the real meat. Is everybody with me tonight? Yes. All right, good. I'm not boring you or freaking you out in my... Okay. After the evolutionary theories of Charles Darwin gained widespread acceptance, it is only logical, now listen to this, that most of its advocates would conclude, now think about this, that the current version of human is not, quote, the final product, but is an early stage in the continuing evolutionary process. This is why this works so well with the philosophy and the understanding and the science and the educators of our day. This is why evolution is such a crucial thing to, to bend the minds of a civilization. <clears throat> now, let me just tell you, when we use the word transhumanism, and it's abbreviated with the H+, meaning you take humanism. I think pretty much everybody understands evolution is the product of humanism and the humanistic philosophy. You take humanism and you add to that you, ha you bypass human. You bypass humanism. You, you go past that. Now, it is, and here's from their official document. It is an international movement that affirms the possibility and the desirability and of, of fundamentally transforming. Listen, you got to hear this. Transforming the human condition by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging to greatly enhance the human intellectual, physical, and psychological capabilities, capacities, that the, and what they predict that human beings may eventually be able to transform themselves into beings which such great, with such greatly expanded abilities as to merit the label post-human. Okay? Now, let me just tell you again that this is not far away. If, if we all are, are blessed with life to live long enough, most of us will see this go into effect. This is why we need to be on top of this issue. Because ultimately, the ideal is we are going to build the perfect man. The perfect, because somehow God messed up with all this. And obviously the ideal is to manufacture man and animal and manufacture man and machine and thereby making us something better than not what we are. Now here is their plan of attack. Starting at Avatar A. Avatar, by the way, is an interesting phrase that they would use because an avatar is, it comes straight out of Hinduism which is the teachings of, of being gods, okay? Which, oddly enough, isn't it funny that in a lot of video games now, you have to make yourself an avatar, okay? This is just the part of the training to get the mindset training. Okay, now, starting 
in, 15, in, in, in 2015, just a couple years from now, and up to 2020, they are now saying that a robotic copy of a human body remotely controlled, this is what they att will attain, according to these that are in the know, will be able to attain between two to seven years. And then from 2020 to 2025, an avatar in which a human brain is transplanted at the end of one's life. That we can take you when you're about ready to die, and let's say you are still viable, there's, there's a lot more living to you, and they want to take you and put you in a different location, get you out of this shell that you're in, and put you in another body and, and use this knowledge. I mean, uh, a, a prime example is, is Stephen Hawkins. <clears throat> And here is the, the, the considered to be the, the smartest man in the world. He's been confined to a wheelchair. He can't even move. He's confined to a wheelchair. The only way he can communicate with the blinking of his eye, they can, they can record the blink and they can be able to basically take that and translate it into words through a computer. That man's brain is by far faster and more advanced than any other human, they just want to be able to take that, imagine putting it in a reconditioned body. Then by 2030, between that and 2035, to have an artificial brain in which a human personality is transferred at the end of one's life. And then by 2040, to be able to produce a hologram like Avatar in which you can put all those together. And who knows, uh, maybe they'll have the image of the beast by that point. Now at this point you're saying, okay, John, dude, you know, you've come off with some weird stuff in the past. <laughs> but this is really weird, John. This is really weird. I should have stayed home and, and watched a movie. Okay. <laughs> Maybe Oblivia, you know. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what, what's, what's, what makes you think that I should take you seriously? We should take this seriously. Well, folks, follow the money. So what do you mean? I'm talking, ladies and gentlemen, not hundreds of millions, but hundreds of billions of dollars are now being invested into this. And I'll give you one example. Singularity, we've already been introduced to what that means. Singularity University in California. It is, and here's from their own statement, designed as a leadership institution, an institute, Singularity is recognized for its positions on transhumanism, radical social change. The school deals with the theoretical aspects of transhumanism, the emerging technologies, with an eye towards the rapid increase in the knowledge of science. So the question is, who supports Singularity? Well, at the top of the list, NASA. Okay, we're talking some big uh, stuff there, some big knowledge, some big advancements. And Google, uh, ePlanet Ventures, which is a capital investment firm which works with high-tech medical and media companies. Uh, the Kauffman Foundation, one of the largest foundations in the United States, uh, pharmaceutical, I'm sure you've heard of the name, they're uh, a giant in that. Canon, and then of course you've got DARPA. DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It is a technical branch within the U.S. Department of Defense, and it has been working on programs that are transhuman in nature, such as the Physical Intelligence Project. According to the media director at Singularity Institute, quote, listen to this, that DARPA has, quote, dozens of human augmentation projects around the world. So now they're trying to produce the super soldier. You know, let me tell you why? Because now this, ladies and gentlemen, is the new arms race. Because if China does this before we do, or any other nation does this in their military, we're going to have to take the back seat. And that's not a feasible thing. We have to be on the cutting edge, according to DARPA. Now, here's the deal. Now that man is evolved, he's convinced himself that he's involved 
to a higher dimension. And this, is, this has been made known by transhumanism. And I want you to consider this. The mixture of man and animal and the mixture of man and machine to achieve godhood and immortality, which opens up a very interesting cover. This is the cover of Time magazine two years ago. Now, I got news for you. This one shocked me. It says 2045, the year man becomes immortal. Now, remember, we've already been introduced in Genesis to this concept when the serpent, a hybrid, by the way, if you ever thought about that, a talking four-legged creature says, you shall not surely die. You shall be as gods knowing good and evil. So folks, this is already something that's already been put in the psyche of man. Now let me just tell you something. The guy who was a co-inventor of the 3D interfacing that we all enjoy in the World Wide Web, he's also a transhumanist. Listen to what he says. Is everybody with me? Men die, planets die, even stars die. We know all this <clears throat> because we know it. We seek something more, a, trans a, a transcendence of transience, translation to incorruptible inc form, an escape, if you will, to stop the will. We seek, therefore, to bless ourselves with perfect knowledge and perfect will to become as gods, to take the universe at hand, to transform it in our, in our image for our own delight. As it is on earth, so shall it be in the heavens. Can you believe this? These are the leading minds, folks, of, of, of this generation. Richard Seed, <clears throat> who is an American... Uh, Physicist, okay, it's not a, a, a dummy. And he's the human cloning researcher. He's best known for forcing a debate on human cloning back in the 1990s. Listen to what this man said. We are going to become gods, period. If you don't like it, get off. Talking about the planet. If you have to contribute, if you don't have to contribute, you don't have to participate. But if you're going to interfere with me becoming God, we're going to have big trouble. Then we'll have warfare. The only way to prevent me is to kill me, and you kill me, and I'll kill you. Now, let me just tell you <clears throat> why this is so interesting is just the first part of this month, on April the 5th in Salt Lake City, the headquarters for the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, they had what they called, and this has been going on for several years now, the Mormon Transhumanist Association Conference. Okay? And what they did is they, they met and had various transhumanist scientists speaking on this. And what you will see in this is the heart of this issue. And I'm wrapping this up now, and I want you to... Give me your undivided attention because I'm going to tell you what spirit's behind this. It's, it, by the way, is the spirit of Antichrist. This plays into the hands of the Antichrist. Now, with this said, most of you understand that Joseph Smith was the founder of the uh, Mormon church, visitation from Moroni, giving him the, the, the revelations of all this stuff. And uh, here's what he says. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. Here then is eternal life to know the only wise and true God and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves and to be kings and priests to God. The same as all gods have done before you, namely by going from one small degree to another, from one small capacity to a great one, to inherit the same power, the same glory, the same exaltation, until you arrive at the station of a god and ascend the throne of eternal power, the same as those who have gone before. Now let me just tell you, in case you don't realize this, 
For every one Assembly of God person you can produce in the United States, the Mormons can produce three Mormons. So don't think we're so hot, okay? And keep an understanding. In this conference were these speakers, these transhumanists, and what they say is very pointed to one particular of all the people that they could talk to and about, this one is the one that they want to deal with. James Hughes, which is a, a sociologist and a bioethics teacher on health policy at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. By the way, you want to send your, your kids to college, you, you just might want to really, really think this one through, whether or not this is the kind of stuff you want your kids exposed to, because it's everywhere now, folks. He's the director of the Institutes of Ethics and Emerging Technology. According to Hughes, listen, Evangelical Christians hold outdated beliefs and are steeped in a faith-based paranoia, uh, paranoia, uh, paranoia, okay? The Hindu and Buddhist traditions, however, best, better fit with transhumanism because of their <coughs> acceptance of evolution. Mormonism, too, he acknowledges, could embrace an evolutionary paradigm. When Hughes was asked during the question and answer session from an online viewer, quote, should we seek dialogue with paranoid Christian fundamentalists? By the way, that would be me. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Should we seek uh, dialogue with paranoid fundamentalists who rant against uh, H plus uh, transhumanism? Or should we seek more than dialogue, maybe even mock them? He responded, because apocalyptic and millennial energies very frequently inspire violence. Now, in case you don't, if you didn't hear that, uh, that mockery right there, we believe in the second coming of Jesus. We believe in the end time events. We believe in Bible prophecy. This apocalyptic type stuff, revelation, that's where the word comes from. So if reaching out across the aisle to someone who thinks I am a spawn of Satan... <coughs> and establishing a relationship so he doesn't come after me with a gun is something I have to do. I'm willing to do it, right? Where'd you get the gun at? I'm not really sure about that part, but anyway, that's another issue. <coughs> it's the ones that haven't reached out yet that I'm worried about. Now, while he's sitting there on that panel, that discussion at this conference on transhumanism, uh, Max Moore <coughs> puts his thought in, as, as Mr. Hughes has just stated that. He cuts in and says, I'm not a spawn of Satan. I'm a spawn of Lucifer. Okay? This comment evokes some laughter in the audience, but Moore was serious even though he had a smile on his face because it was Moore who wrote back in 1991, listen to this quote, Lucifer is the embodiment of reason, of intelligence, of critical thought. He stands against the dogma of God and all other dogmas. He stands for the exploration of new ideals. Join me, join Lucifer, and join in fighting God in his entropic forces with our minds, our wills, and our courage, God's army is strong, but they are, not, they are backed by ignorance, fear, and cowardice. Reality is fundamentally on our side, forward in the light. Well, anyway, he also spoke at this conference. We're talking now, folks, just recently. And here's what he has to say, and I'm almost done. Quote, I should tend to want to discourage talks, talking of gods in transhumanism, regardless if we're religious or not, I think we're, we can probably do better than that. After all, many of the traditional concepts are not very enlightening or inspiring, especially the older versions in the Old Testament, uh, referring to God, okay? Talking about how childish he is. He's a, 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 a cosmic sadist who seems to like to set things up to torture us. Now, let me just tell you, that, that guy says, join me with Lucifer. 
Okay, join me with I'm not. I'm not Satan. I'm Lucifer's fan. Okay. Well, I want you to consider this, folks. When we see the communication that first took place in the garden, coming from Lucifer, as he embedded himself into this serpent, you find out the spirit of this, and I'm going to wrap it up with this uh, statement from, uh, here's the actual magazine, Transhumanists as have their own magazines called uh, uh, H+. And here was an article that just came out uh, February of this year called Transhumanism, A Bridge to Divinity. What, what this life is, far, is for is a question that transhumanists are engaging with all, of, uh, with all of the time. Most of us wish for longer lives so that we can live up to the potential that has not yet been defined by the confines of the human brain. To see eternally the grain of sand is all very well, but to live in that eternity and to experience it in multidimensionality with senses that are not dulled by confines of present human equipment would be true bliss. Responsible, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, and benevolent would be the totality of the sensory apparatus of the new human. What then is humanity? I would speculate the opinion that humanity is the seed of all potential that have flowered into what we have painted as divinity. The lines blur. The true revelation will be that human and divine are one and the same. Okay? So folks, here's where we're at. Basically, this is what it boils down to. The Bible warned that the time would come that they would go this direction. And you just need to keep your heads up because what is happening is um, worth your attention. Amen? Amen? God bless you all. Thank you so much.